Hello, is anybody there? I've had a nightmare trying to go on live stream. I have a scheduled event and absolutely no idea how you start an event once you've already scheduled it. So um, if you're watching here, um, we're waiting for all the people that are hanging out for me where I scheduled the event, but where I can't see how to start it. Oh, Diane, hi. <laughs> Hello, thanks for making over here. I'm hoping some other people will join us in a minute. How very frustrating that I can't see how to start my scheduled event. I'll have to um, contact my YouTube mentor to ask her how you do that. Um, yeah. You'd have thought it'd be really simple. Anyway, I'm going to give it a few. Hey, hello. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Mrs. Cynthia G. Well, I didn't. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I didn't really figure it out. I just, as I think it was Diane suggested, or oh, no, it was... Um, it was DG, DJL, DJRLLR suggested I've just started a new, completely different live stream. Hi, Teresa. Um, and uh, invited you all over here. I don't know how to start the one I scheduled. So I will have to find that out anyway, you live and learn. Um, and to explain why I've got such red cheeks, <laughs> I nearly didn't make it here at all. Um, I had a total nightmare getting here, getting back in time to be on the court. And when you're a professional organiser, being late is like the worst thing. <laughs> it adds this extra layer of stress to being late. So I've just cycled um, what should have taken about an hour in about 30 minutes to get back here in time. And I'm here. And we're finally starting 12 minutes late. So welcome so much. Um, this is the gym. If you don't see a link, you may want to put out another in your notice. That's a really good point. Um, I'm going to stick it right now. So, okay, hang on for one more second and I'm going to share it to all my social media channels. Twitter. Can't do it to Instagram because can't do it from the computer. Where else have I shared it? Oh, people on my mailing list, afraid they will have to find us. Okay, um, what I might do is uh, put one more message on the scheduled one. All right. Okay, and now I think we just go for it because uh, we're late in our starting. So thank you so much for joining me. It's really, really great to have you all on the call. And thank you to everyone who sent in um, questions in advance because that uh, was really exciting and gave me a chance to do a little bit of thinking about some of the stuff that, um, that you wanted to know. Um, so if anybody else is here and you haven't said hello in the chat box yet, do just put a little hello and give me a wave um, so that I know that you're there. Um, I don't even know how long the session's going to last. Um, I didn't set an, a time for it because I didn't know how it was going to go. It's the first time I've ever done a live stream, um, as you can tell. Um, so I'm just going to go with it for as long as questions keep coming in or until I collapse from hunger because I haven't had my evening meal yet. And um, we are focusing on sentimental stuff today um, because, well, it was suggested by people when I asked what you'd like me to do a live stream about. And I know that it's something that a lot of people struggle with. And I, when I ask clients what's the kind of clutter that they struggle with most, they tend to either say paperwork or sentimental stuff. And we keep sentimental stuff for all sorts of reasons. And we'll talk about some of them later on in this session. 
Um, and some of those reasons are perfectly healthy and some of them are less so. And there's nothing wrong with having sentimental stuff. Having sentimental stuff is great. And I've got loads of sentimental stuff right there on my left is a notice board um, on my wall. In fact, I'm going to see if I can turn the webcam and show you. Can you see that notice board with the apple on it? The apple shaped notice board. Um, that is in my office and I use it all the time. And it was given to me by my by my oldest friend, a friend that I've I've had since I was eight years old and she was seven. Um, and it was a birthday present, and I'm really fond of it. And it's you know, I use it because it's because I'm fond of it, and that's lovely. It's really nice to have it. There's nothing wrong with having sentimental stuff. But when we hold on to sentimental stuff for unhealthy reasons, more than any other type of clutter, it keeps us stuck in the past and it stops us from living life to the full, which also makes it a really great type of clutter to work on. Because, again, more than with any other type of clutter, when we clear out sentimental stuff, we make room for the new. Um, and, 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 you know, and that means we can really get out there and live our lives, live our life to the full. So this would be a good time to share something actually that um, Barbara shared with me by email. And I'm gonna get, just gonna read a quote to you. She said, I wonder if we sometimes keep things from the past because we are not appreciative or enthusiastic enough with the now. Maybe we're afraid we will not succeed in making the now as special as the past from which we keep the items that clutter our homes. And I think that's a really great insight. So thank you. I don't know if you're on the call, Barbara, but thank you very much for, um, for sharing it. So. My intention for this, this live stream is to give you some insights so that as you're decluttering, as you're sorting through your stuff, you can recognize what it is that has, that's having you want to hold on to something. And then you can, with, with that insight, you can shift from keeping stuff out of guilt or fear or some kind of irrational thinking that isn't helping you to letting go of the stuff that's keeping you stuck and at the same time honoring and taking pleasure in the stuff that you really do love because that's important too it's not just about getting rid of stuff decluttering for decluttering sake it that de listen decluttering for decluttering sake sake is boring and pointless i think that too no the reason we declutter is so that we can enjoy life and live our lives to the full and get out there and do all the stuff that we love and share it with other people. And that includes taking pleasure in the things that remind us of people, events, places that we love or have loved. And as I said already, making room for the new, by which I don't necessarily mean physical stuff, it may be physical stuff, but I also mean possibilities for our lives. So that might be a new friendship or a new relationship or a new way of being in a, in a relationship, or it might be a new job or a new interest, a new hobby, a new look or a new home or entertaining or, you know, even a new way of, of experiencing something that you already have, you know, one of those that you already have but experiencing it in a different way. Right. So that's why I want to, to, to talk about uh, sentimental stuff and what my intention is for this session. So let's do it. Um, I've got some questions to, that if, um, to get together started. I've got some stuff I'd love to talk to you about. And if you want to ask a question at any time, just jump in and um, and ask the question and I will see what I can do to answer it. So just to say hello to more people. Hello, oh, Jill, thank you so much for suggesting um, starting this other live. I hope people find us. I, I will have to contact YouTube and ask them how you start a scheduled live stream. Um, and that's true, Mr. Sidha G. They will see it later um, if they don't catch it live. And I know there are quite a lot of people that said that um, they're going to, to watch the, the recording. Um, and hello to Margaret in Hawaii and Kathleen in Kathleen, Missouri. Fantastic. And that is really true about um, the G, about sentimental stuff being part of you and, and reflecting who you are. And yeah, and giving guests something to, to talk about. And it's a way of sharing what's important to you. So when someone comes into your home, they can see the things that you have around and it makes a conversation point and it it enables you to open up about yourself. I really, I really agree with that. And the key is to is therefore to be able to display the stuff that you really love and that you want people to engage with. And that means not having so much stuff that you can't see it all or it gets damaged or you forget you've got it or you just feel overwhelmed by it and you can't enjoy it. So yeah, I really, really agree with that. It's a great, that's a great point. Thank you for making it. All right. So Let's, have, let's start by having a look at some of the reasons why we keep sentimental stuff. And I, and I want to say again, there's nothing wrong with having sentimental stuff. 
Um, you know, I, I have got loads of sentimental stuff and I love the stuff that I've got. And when I put my declutter sentimental stuff video calls together, it, it actually made me aware of how much sentimental stuff I had. You know, I've got I've got a memory box, which I keep in my loft, which has got some items in it. And I kind of, you know, on the top of my head, I would have said that's where my sentimental stuff is. But actually, when I came to think about it, things like that notice board that I just talked about and all sorts of other things around my house, my home, have sentimental associations too. So, yeah, to just to say, I'll probably say it several times, there's nothing wrong with having sentimental stuff around you. So I'm just going to look at some of the reasons why we why we feel sentimental about inanimate objects. And there's some classic, some well-recognised psychological um phenomena that go on around this and one of those is called the endowment effect so i'm going to tell you about the endowment effect now and the endowment effect is that um as soon as we own an object it um it seems more valuable to us inherently because we own it and this was shown by a um a really interesting psychological study what they did was they got two groups of people and they um, handled them separately and this group were given um a mug a free mug and they were told that the mug was worth, say, £4.99. I don't know exactly, but let's say they were told £4.99. And then they were offered um, a box of chocolates, which they were told was also, also cost £4.99. And they could swap it if they wanted to. They could keep the mug or they could swap it for the chocolates up to them. And this group had the opposite experience. They gave them a box of chocolates and said this cost £4.99. And then they said, if you like, you can swap it for a mug which also costs £4.99. Up to you, you can keep the chocolate, you can sort it for the mug. And both groups, um, roughly the same proportion, and it's a high proportion, chose to keep the object they were given in the first place. So what that shows you is it's nothing to do with the actual value of the object. It's because you already own it. Once you own it, you think, no, this is this is a better object. If you've been given the chocolates, you think, well, that's better than a mug. And if you've been given the mug, you think, well, that's better than the chocolates. They might be worth the same amount, but you know, the, the one I prefer is, is the one that you already have. So that's that's the endowment effect. And you can see how that works with stuff. As soon as you own something, it, it feels more valuable to you. So it feels like, you know, it, it's harder to let go of it than it was to acquire it. Personally, I think there's also a reverse endowment effect. I've never seen a like any psychological research that um, supports this. But I notice in myself that sometimes when I'm getting rid of something, particularly if I'm getting rid of it on free or free cycle, basically the same thing. Um, so if you don't know what that is, that's um, a web or app app based um, forum where you can give stuff away in your local community. So you, people join everyone in the local community can join this app and then you um, you offer something that you don't want. And if you if you are on the forum and you think, oh, yeah, I'd like that, you message that person and say, yes, please, I'd like it. And then the person who's offering it chooses somebody to give it to and just gives it away. So sometimes I put something on my local group and I'm a little bit like, mm. Yeah, you know, I, I think I want to get rid of this, 100% sure. And then somebody wants it and I think, oh, am I doing the right thing? And then I hand it over at the door and it's as they're walking away, as they're going down my steps, leaving my house, I think, yeah, of course I didn't want it. You know, it's like it's gone when I don't care anymore and all I feel is relief that it's left my house. So I, I think there's a reverse endowment effect as well. And that's the endowment effect and it's a good one to watch out for. Like it is the reason that I'm wanting to hold on to this object simply because I I own it and maybe I've owned it for some time. I'm used to having it around and it's not actually valuable when I think about it. That's one that's worth thinking about. Another one is essentialism. Now, essentialism is where we um, feel that an object has taken on the essence of something. This, a really good way, uh, place to see where this operates is um, wanting to own something that used to belong to a famous person. So if you want to own a dress that Marilyn Monroe once wore or something, that would be really expensive. But, you know, as an example, you know, what it's just a dress and she doesn't own it anymore and she's nowhere near it, you know, but the very fact that that famous person owned it makes it feel more like, it, like it's a part of them. It's almost like a part of them. And that happens to our own stuff too. Like, so because we own it, because we've gone, particularly if we've had it for a long time, it's almost like it has a bit of ourselves in it. So that's, that's another thing that goes on, essentialism. Um, another one is uh, the sunk cost fallacy. This isn't so much really about, I mean, it applies to more than just sentimental stuff, though, uh, this one, although I guess there's a definite a sentimental element to it. This is my favourite. I really like the sunk cost fallacy. I like looking out for it. The sunk cost, it's an economic term, the sunk cost for anything is um, what you have put in to get the thing. 
So um, of, often it's money. You know, you might have spent some money to get a thing. Um, but it can also be um, emotion. It can be energy. It can be time. Um, and the fallacy is that somehow you're getting that uh, energy or emotional time or money back by holding on to the object. So the classic example would be where we hold on to something because it costs a lot of money. We might have bought a, a piece of clothing um, and we never wear it. We've had it for ages and still got the labels attached. But it costs so much money, I can't just chuck it out. Well, that, you know, there's a fallacy there. The fallacy is that somehow you're getting that money back by holding on to the object. You're not getting that money back. You spent the money. All you've got now is a choice as to whether to keep the object or not. And around sentimental stuff, that, that tends to it tends to be more about emotion than it does about money or it might be about effort like you might be holding on to your school notes or your university notes because you put so much time and effort into producing them even though you finished your your studying decades ago and you're never going to look at that again that's another really good one to look out for and the last one that I want to talk about is transitional objects and um, the classic transitional object is a child's teddy bear uh, a transitional object is an object that kind of um is used as comfort it like represents um the, the comfort giver so for a child their their teddy bear can make a kind of transition between them and their parent so you know a lot of us have had transitional objects when we were younger we might be holding on to those because we still have that attachment we may still have transitional objects in our lives but again nothing wrong with it with having transitional objects it's just good to be aware of what's going on. It gives us a bit of power over the choice about whether we want to keep something or not. All right. So um, let me see. I was actually I was going to I mean, talking about transitional objects. I wanted to, to quote Barbara again because um, she uh, she said that's some really good insights. And she said that she keeps some things out of feelings of guilt or inadequacy. And she wonders whether she should ask herself, what does this object symbolize for me? If it symbolizes something bad or unpleasant, what would I need in order to let it go? If it symbolizes something good or pleasant, what can I create more? What can, what can I do to create more of those pleasant feelings and experiences today? What would I like to remember with myself, friends or family in five or 10 years about today, this month or year? So, yeah, guilt and fear. And it's another reason why we hold on to things. And, and Barbara kind of had an insight about that there that I wanted to share with you. Great work, Barbara. Thanks for sharing that. So, again, the reason I'm telling you about all these psychological phenomena isn't because there's anything wrong with holding on to something because of them. If you want to keep a jumper that you inherited from someone you love because wearing it feels like they're cuddling you, that's great. Do it. I'm sharing it with you because if when we have those insights, we just have some power over it. We have the choice instead of kind of feeling like it's out of our control. You know, we just we just feel like we can't let go of this object and we don't know why. And yet, you know, we half want to. When you have those insights, you're just in a stronger position to say, well, I can see that what's going on is here. It, what, what's going on here is this. And, you know, and I may want to keep the object or I may not. But it doesn't feel quite so kind of out of your control. All right. So that's just a few little insights I wanted to share with you. Um, I've got some questions that people uh, emailed me or sent to me on Twitter or YouTube comments and so on. So I can go through some of those. Does anybody here have a question they want to ask before I do that? Thanks, Margaret. <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm kind of going over quite a lot of ground quite quickly. So I'm glad it, it, um, it found it helpful. Shall I, shall I deal with some of the questions that some people sent to me in advance? I had a question from Margaret by email, which was, how do you choose between sentimental items? And that's a great question, because the truth is it's possible to sort through all your stuff to do a complete declutter of your home using my definition of clutter. Are you legally obliged to keep it? Are you realistically likely to use it? Do you simply love it? And at the end of that process, don't have too much stuff. And when that happens, it's usually sentimental stuff that's taking up most of the space. And it's a tough one because the truth is that if you've got so much sentimental stuff that your home doesn't function and you can't do the stuff you want, the only way out is to make those difficult choices. But what you don't want to have to do is let go of the memories. So the trick is to keep enough stuff and the right items that enable you to honour and keep alive the memories that you love without allowing it to swamp you both emotionally and physically and to let go of the rest gently and without regrets. And I think an important element of that is really appreciating the things that you keep. 
If you're keeping something for the memories it evokes and it's stuffed into a box, which is bursting at the seams under a load of other boxes, getting dusty or going mouldy, then it's not giving you that warm, fuzzy feeling that we keep our sentimental stuff for. So my recommendation is that you consider not only whether or not to keep something, but also what you're going to do with it. So are you going to display it, use it, get it out every now and then to appreciate it, show it to others? And in doing that, as you ask yourself those questions, you might notice that some things are less important to you than others and that you can let some things go. Also, don't focus only on sentimental stuff. It's easy to get sucked into worrying about what we're going to do with our sentimental stuff to the extent that we don't notice that there's other stuff we could be shifting. And then when we shift the other stuff, sometimes we make room for our sentimental stuff and we don't have to let it go after all. So that's that's why I say to be systematic and thorough when you declutter rather than cherry pick. Rather than looking at all your stuff and saying, oh, you know, I can get rid of that, I can get rid of that. Go systematically through everything one thing at a time because that way you won't overlook anything and you might even find that you let go of enough that you don't have to worry about the sentimental stuff i'm going to say at this point if there's anybody on this um live stream that hasn't joined green and tidy do do that do go to my website and join green and tidy because you'll get my free uh seven part video course uh, which is the um seven biggest clutter clearing mistakes and how to avoid them it's like seven really short videos and one of them is specifically about that issue it's about cherry picking and how to avoid it so do make sure that you've joined green and tidy um so, so then i also had a question from Teresa. i think i think it's Teresa that's on this call Teresa, you said um how do you decide emotionally because you said I, I feel like i don't do anything with my sentimental items because i just freeze and i become paralyzed when things are sentimental so I, i'm on I think that question leads on from Margaret's a little bit. And it's great that you notice that that's what goes on around you with sentimental stuff. So my recommendation is that you let yourself feel what you're feeling. Like I said, deal with one thing at a time and give yourself a moment with each thing. In my um, process, the way that I tell people to approach decluttering, I recommend spending no more than about 30 seconds on each item. It's not precise. I don't mean you have to set a timer, but but roughly 30 seconds if you, if, you, if you can't decide in 30 seconds you need to move on to the next item 30 seconds is enough time to, to hold the item take a breath see what comes up from you and, and see if you're ready to make a decision and then if you're not sure after those 30 seconds you can put it into your not sure box or bag or pile and come back to it at the end let your brain process it in the meantime and you might find the decision comes easily at the end and then if it still doesn't keep the item at least at least until you next declutter that same area i'm going to post a couple of links because i'm talking here about my seven step decluttering process um and the not sure box or bag or pile and just in case anybody hasn't seen them or is not familiar with them I'm just posting a couple of links now. Uh, nearly. Hang on. They got stuck together. Just gonna separate them. Oh, hang on, I'm gonna do them separately. That ignore that one. I'm deleting it. Okay, because they got mixed up. Right, okay, it's in separately. So this is the link to the full video that shows the whole process in full. And then this is a link to a shorter video that just summarizes it really quickly. Um, so just in case anybody here that isn't familiar with what I'm talking about, when I talk about the not sure pile and when I talk about my seven step decluttering process. Margaret, your trigger phrase is I might need it in Kathleen. Yes, yes. And that's a lot of people's trigger phrase. Well, what if I need it? Um, and, and you know, it can be difficult to tell, can't it? You can find yourself thinking, well, you know, how do I know if I'm going to need it or not? Um, what I tend to say as a guide, um, if you if you don't know, if you think you might need it, but you don't know, have a think about when you last used it and think about whether you last used it in the last 12 months. Um, now, I'm not saying that's a rule. I'm not saying if you, um, uh, haven't used it in the last 12 months you should get rid of it but um it's a guide you know and, and and if you think if you think when did i last use it and you think actually you know it's been a really long time then it, it just helps you to think realistically about whether it really is likely to be useful or not also think about um like how easily you could replace it if you if you did you know if you if you take the risk and you let it go 
and then you wish you hadn't and you needed it is it actually something that's very easily cheaply replaced so it might be worth freeing up the space and taking the risk of letting it go if, it, if it's easy to replace i hope that's helpful to you kathleen and margaret and anybody else who has that um trigger phrase as well all right so let's have a look what other questions have we got lisa okay. lisa french you um put a, a question on youtube she asked me about birthday and christmas cards she said i tend to keep recent ones and if the person who sent it to me has since, oh, she said, I tend to keep the most recent ones from people. And then if the person passes away, she doesn't like to throw away the last cards she received from that person. And then she wonders why she keeps them. So thank you for sharing that, Lisa. I think it's a really good question to ask yourself and wondering why you keep them. And, and of course, only you can answer it. So, um, but I'll give you, I'll give you my thoughts on it. Similarly to what I was just saying about any um, sentimental stuff, really, I suggest that you hold, like, what, do you take one of the cards that you're uncertain why you're keeping that's, you know, fits this, you know, that you, you, so you were saying that you, you get cards from people if the person has passed away since you're not sure whether to let it go or not. So, so hold a card in your hand that was given to you by someone who has since passed away and that you're not sure why you're keeping and and see what comes up from it for you. So ask yourself, why am I keeping this? And and you know, see see what comes up. You could also consider whether you have other things that remind you of that person. Whether you need that that card to remind you. My guess, for what it's worth, is that the reason why you find it difficult to let go of that card is because the conversation feels incomplete. They left this world, and so that conversation between you got cut off. And you might be left with things you would have liked to say to them. Now, if that is the case, if I'm right about that, what I recommend is that you take the time to say that stuff. And you can do that out loud or you can do it in writing, whatever works for you. Make, make a little ceremony of it. It doesn't matter whether or not you believe they can hear you. The important thing is that you allow the unsaid stuff that's inside you to come to the surface and come out into the world. And when you've done it, like do that little exercise, give yourself some time to say out loud what you would like to say to that person or to write it down. And then ask yourself again, whether you want to keep that card. And there's no right answer. You may still want to keep it, in which case do so, or you may be ready to let it go. But thanks. Thanks for that question, Lisa. Nora, I'm so sorry for your loss. That's really, really tough. What, what is the ALF? I don't know what the ALF is. Um, oh, assisted living, maybe? And you had 24 hours to clear out her room. That's really, really tough. So um, did that mean that you brought a lot of stuff back with you? Did you have to just kind of bring stuff into your own home um, because you weren't sure whether to let it go or not? I, I, tell me a little bit more about what happened there. I'm going to answer another question. Give you It's up to you, obviously, you don't have to, but if you want to share a little bit more about what the implications of that were so that I can... Um, respond more to it then go ahead and put something else in the chat box um okay and in the meantime i'm gonna look at a question which was emailed to me by dev and dev asked about soft toys and she said or maybe he i'm not sure said my partner and i were both brought up to think of soft toys as having feelings we have too many soft toys in our house many without any particular sentimental attachment. How can we get rid of ungiftable soft toys with minimum pain or guilt? Hmm, soft toys are a classic transitional object. You know, it's a proxy for the parent being with us when we're vulnerable, like when we're falling asleep, giving us comfort. And there's also a lot of essentialism with a soft toy. We know that it's just a thing and not really alive, but we see it as kind of having the essence of life in it and having feelings and emotions. Dev, I think the key for you is when you say that many don't have sentimental attachments, those are the ones to let go. And it may be that the simple act of asking this question has lessened that sense of guilt that you'll feel about that. But I suggest that you do it mindfully. Again, hold each soft toy in your hand and see what it brings up. Does it have a sentimental value for you or not? Now you asked specifically about ungiftable soft toys and I wonder what makes them ungiftable I wonder I may, maybe they may be worn out or it may be that they're so old that they're not labeled as fire resistant which would mean that, that I know charity shops in the UK can't take uh, soft toys if they don't have the fire the, the EU label that says that they're fire resistant 
if that's the case, whether they're, you know, either of those, whether they're worn out or or it's because they're not labelled as fire resistant, could you perhaps offer them on a local free go off recycle group? Somebody might take them for upcycling or, or an art project, for example. Your last resort, of course, is fabric recycling. You know, you can in the UK, you can take any fabrics to a, a charity shop. Most charity shops will take them and tell them these are rags for recycling and they, they make a small amount of money by selling those on. Um, if you're on the call, uh, let me know if that's uh, answered you on the live stream, I should say. Let me know if that's answered your question or if you have any follow up questions to that. I'm not sure if I've completely answered your question there. Um, hi, Eloise. Thank you for joining us. All right, let's see. So let's let's move on to, because it kind of leads on from Deb's question a little bit on about how to dispose of some of our ex-sentimental stuff. Um, Charmaine asked by email, how do we dispose of those precious objects? So that's another great question. You might be ready to let something go, but you you want to ensure that it goes on being valued. You know, it ha because it has some sentimental value to you, you, you can't just put it in the recycling or... Uh, you know, even send it to landfill or, or um, incineration. Or you might, you know, if like me, you're committed to minimising your environmental impact. You also, you know, it's really hard just to send something into the general rubbish. Like, it's so much easier to let something go if you can find a new home for it or at least get it recycled. So I'm going to make some suggestions for ways to dispose um, mindfully of our ex-sentimental stuff. And if you've got other good ideas, please post them in the chat box. So upcycling, remaking, repurposing things, um, get jewellery remade into something that you will actually wear, use a cup with a broken, ha broken handle as a flower pot, make a quilt out of clothes or other textiles. My brother and his wife used their children's first shoes as cupboard door handles, which was really cute. I wish I'd got them to take a photo for me. Before my, they, they don't live there anymore. They, they've sold the house. but And unfortunately, they didn't take a photo of it before they left because I would really like a photo of that. There are tons of ideas on the internet for ways to upcycle and reuse things. So you can look on something like Pinterest or Etsy for inspiration, or you can even just Google, you know, how could I upcycle whatever the item is. But I have a caveat on that one, which is to be realistic. So don't let telling yourself that you're going to make something become another excuse for holding on to it if realistically you're never going to get around to the project. And definitely don't go out and buy all the crafting items you need for it and then just leave them sitting around adding to your clutter and never get around to the project. But yeah, upcycling, obviously that's one way to to um, to, to move on our, our, um, our unwanted stuff. Giving it to somebody you know is another option. Make sure it's somebody who definitely wants it. Don't offload your clutter onto somebody else and you give them a clutter problem. Um, obviously, charity shops or thrift stores is another option. Free cycling or freegling we've already talked about. You might want to sell an item on, on something like eBay or with a car boot sale, garage sale, yard sale. Um, local museums and archives is another option for, especially if you've got stuff that's particularly connected to your local area. Um, I have to say, you need to be prepared that they may not want it. They might have lots of that, wherever the item is already, or it might not match their needs, or it might not be in good enough condition for them. But if you, you know, if you've got, I don't know, old photographs or of the local area, or postcards, or something that relates to a, an important building or an important person from that area, it might be worth contacting your local museum and seeing if they want it. Um, a lot of us have um, kind of found objects about. I've got some up here. Up here are some pebbles from a beach that I used to visit, um, and uh, an obvious way to move them on, if you're if you're ready to do that, is to simply return them to where they came from. So take the pebbles back to the beach, let feathers go in the park, take shells back to the beach. You know, just drop things back in nature where they, you know, put them back where they belong. You can always get more from nature if you if you want to. Have you got any other ideas of, of good ways to move on sentimental stuff? Do do post that into the uh, into the chat box. Um, so let's have a look. Mr. Cynthia G, I know you're on the live stream. Hello. You asked about, I'm going to say, like you said, you've got boxes filled to the brim of sentimental stuff. Have you, so you said you've already been through your stuff and what you've got now is boxes filled to the brim and you're overwhelmed with taking on each box and moving forward. And you said, I guess part of my problem is storage or where to put stuff that you need to keep like legal documents and receipts and you're asking for the most efficient filing system too. So if I've understood you right and tell me if I haven't, 
You're asking also here about how to store the non-sentimental stuff, particularly paperwork, legal documents and receipts and so on. So I don't want to spend too long on this live stream, or live stream on how to create a filing system because I want to focus on sentimental stuff. But just really briefly, I don't know how anybody lives without a filing cabinet. Yeah, I think you can probably see mine behind me. There it is, my filing cabinet. Um, so, um, yeah, I really recommend that you have it. You might not need a four drawer one. I run two businesses from my home, and that, that holds all my I hold stuff for both my businesses and my personal admin, and there's a drawer of stationery in there. So, you may not need a four drawer filing cabinet. A two drawer one might well be enough. Um, but file into a filing cabinet according to how you would look for something. So as you're creating your files, think about what you would look for when you wanted that document. So say it's a, I don't know, a copy of your will. What what would you, you know, what would you be thinking? What would you expect to find it under in a filing cabinet and then file it according to that? And with regard to those over full boxes, I really hear your overwhelm about it. And with all decluttering, I recommend that you take it slowly and systematically. So deal with it a small amount at a time. And like I said to Margaret, focus on keeping enough items and the right items that you can honor and keep alive the memories you love without allowing it to swamp you both emotionally and physically. So you may, it may be that you have got more than you need to keep those memories alive. And it can help to develop a, like a curator's eye. Think of yourself as a curator. So you were saying about um, how the sentimental stuff around your home um, creates a talking point for guests. So you, you want that to, you know, imagine you were curating a museum. You would want to put enough stuff around so that it will catch people's eye and enable them to engage with it. But you don't want so much stuff around that people are like, oh, I can't see. Oh, they can't see the stuff at the back because it's behind the stuff in front. So... Imagine you're helping somebody else create an archive and then think about whether a particular item should go in it. Does it do a good job of prompting happy memories? Does it stand out or is it hard to spot because there's so much other stuff around? If it's drowned out by other stuff, which of those objects is most important to you? What's the best way to preserve or display the item? And, and see if you can keep fewer items that fulfill the same purpose. Or do you need lots of things that all remind you of the same person or event or whatever it is? For example, I'm just going to share a story. I was asked to keep this anonymous, but I was I, the, the, the green and tidy membrane question was, was OK with me sharing it. So I didn't give her name. She had an extensive collection of shot glasses, each picked up as a souvenir of a holiday or a visit to a place of interest. And she emailed me saying, I don't know what to do about these shot glasses. And then a week later, she emailed again to say that she'd worked it out for herself. She, what she did was she asked herself, do I have another souvenir from that destination? And if she did, did she prefer the shot glass or did she prefer the other souvenir? And if the other souvenir won, the shot glass went in the charity bag, which is great. Like really, it was really brilliant that she, you know, she saw that for herself. Similarly, another Green and Tidy member suggests keeping the reminder that's most evocative, the one that does the best job of evoking your memories. So set a limit for yourself on the amount that you'll keep. You, and a really good way to do that is to create a memory box and limit yourself to that box. When the box is full, if you want to add something else, something has to go, even though it passes the, the not cluster test because, because you love it. And if you've got a lot of sentimental stuff, you might need several memory boxes. You might need a box for each child or a box specifically for your daughter or son's wedding or um, a box for mementos of your childhood. And that's, and that's fine. But remember that the aim is for your home to function well for you and for anyone else that lives there. So don't just keep getting more memory boxes. The point of memory boxes is to, or one of the points of memory boxes is to set a limit on what you keep. It can help to develop a, pra a practice of just keeping some of what you're tempted to keep. So ongoingly, not building up too much. So if you find yourself keeping, say you go to the theater and you keep the program and the flyer and the ticket stub, and the muse and the admission for uh, museum admission and you know like or you, you you go on holiday and you keep the plane ticket and the boarding pass and the uh, the brochure that the holiday came out of and of course all the photos you know do you need all those things or, or can you limit yourself to just one or two of them is, is every event really that special is every item really that special remember that the definition of special is better greater or otherwise different from what is usual so by definition, not everything can be special. All right. So, yeah, 
Um, what else did I want to say about that? Just, just again, at the end of the day, your memories live inside you. You will not lose the memories if you let go of the items. But, and again, that doesn't mean it's wrong to keep the items, but the memories are here. They're inside you, whatever you do. I'm just going to catch up with you on the chat now. Let's have a look. Ah, yeah, it's true, Mr. Sympathy. You would be surprised what people want will buy. When you put stuff on free, because especially when it's free, you'd be amazed what people will take. Yeah, and teachers do love stuff to use with students. In fact, a lot of my clients are teachers because um, because everything for particularly primary school teachers, because everything is a potential resource, it can be really difficult for them to know what to let go of. So yeah, you're right, teachers do love stuff, but um, make sure you're not cluttering them up. Um, Eloise, pictures from years ago, photographs, do you mean, I wonder? Um, that a lot of people have lots of photographs. You might need other kinds of pictures, but yeah, great to get to organize them. You're going to set some time aside to do that. I really recommend that you do. Uh, oh, nice idea. Yeah, putting rocks or shells on the top of a plant pot to decorate it. Yeah, nice idea. Laura, yeah, assisted living facility, right? I'm just, oh, right. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. That's awful. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Wow. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if people watching the video can also see the um, chats. I'm just going to say what Laura said. So um, uh, Laura's mother passed away a month ago and um, Laura lives a long way away and she could only take a carry on. Um, and they had to get all her stuff out of a assisted living facility in 24 hours. And so Laura was only able to save her mother's hairbrush as a memento. Um, I'm so sorry that happened to you, Laura. That's that's really, really tough. That must have been awful. Ms. Sinthiji, you were asking about important documents, not objects. So you mean, do you mean uh, documents that have sentimental associations or you mean um, things like your will and your passport and uh, like non-sentimental but legally important documents? Clarify that for me and I'll come back to you. Um, and what's that? Right, definitely special. Yes, yeah, sure. I'll put it in the chat. Uh, let's see. Hang on, there we go. Okay. Okay. Legal and sentimental. Well, I mean, it's the same answer, really, Mr. Cynthia G. It's, you know, it's the same thing. It, with documents, you know, they're, they're by the nature, they're flat. And the I think the best place to keep them is in a filing cabinet. Um, and you could have a section of the filing cabinet for sentimental stuff. And again, it's just thinking about what you would look for if you wanted to find that object. So, you know, would it be holidays or children or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and if you've got lots of things that go in one category, then you want to start thinking about self-categorising. Um, I hope that helps. I'll post again if you have a supplementary question to that. Uh, Lisa, yes, absolutely. We can take photos. You're very welcome, Mr. Cynthia G. Uh, Lisa, yes, absolutely. We can take we can take photographs to preserve the memory of things. That's, that's a good one. I have to say, it, it's one that, professional organizers talk about a lot and I have to say for me personally it doesn't work a photograph of an object wouldn't I wouldn't it wouldn't work for me I either want the object or I don't and a photograph wouldn't work as a halfway house but I know it does work for some people so yeah it's really great to share that and if it's helpful to you then great go ahead and do that um all right so actually let's let's yeah let's talk about um a bit more about what to do with sentimental objects Another question from Maxine by email. Maxine said she's created a, a seaside theme where there were some shelves in her lounge. But um, so she, I think she's got new shelves there or something. But anyway, she's created a, sea, a seaside theme um, with uh, some seaside themed wallpaper. Um, but previously, there were some other ornaments that lived there, too, which do not have a seaside theme to them, but do have sentimental value to her, like holiday souvenirs and something that her mother gave her. And she asks, what should I do with them now that they no longer belong in that space? I'm just going to have some water. Okay, I'm a bit croaky. Bear with me. That's the... Um, water bottle that I had with me on my bike because I didn't have time to get a glass of water, so I just grabbed that as I ran up the stairs getting on this live stream just in time well except that I didn't because I couldn't work out how to start it but that's another story anyway back to Maxine so Maxine if you still love those items and you want them on display I think you should go ahead and find another place to display them um if you're short of display space things that see a seaside theme and display space display space are both quite hard to say I'm noticing um if you're short of display space 
Um, what you could do is rotate what you have on display. So you could keep the ornaments that are not on display safely packed away, safely wrapped up. And then every few weeks, perhaps say at the start of the month or, you know, at a time that feels right for you, change over which ones are on display. And then as you're doing that, if you notice that there are some that you never actually choose to put on display, you might consider whether you're ready to let them go. One, there's a, I have a Green and Tidy member who does that with her grandchildren. She, she has um, some objects on display and some stored away. And then every now and then when she sits with her grandchildren, they decide which ones to put on display instead, which I think is a really lovely way to share her memories with them. So um, what else could we do with um, with sentimental objects? Well, obviously using them is one thing. I showed you my notice board, which I use on a you know on an ongoing basis. If you've got crockery that you know, say you you know people used to get wedding china, just you know, just use it. And if a piece gets broken, well, you know what crockery is meant to be used. I actually broke a favourite mug this morning, my favourite coffee mug. And I, I had a, I dropped it. I caught it on the architrave of the door as I went out the door, and it smashed on the floor. And I, I, walked, I, I looked at it. So like, luckily, it wasn't full, by the way. It just had the dregs of the coffee in it. I looked at it, and I, and I could feel this. Oh, come on, me! And then I was like, well, you know, I've had it for years. It's just a mug, and I'm going to be okay with it. And that's, well, that's one way of decluttering. Like, so you know, maybe just accept that things are meant to be used, and if they wear out or they get broken, well. That's, that's what happens. I'm just catching up on the chat again. Uh, families will be put into do. That's great that you did that. You took, so they were Mr. Cynthia G. Was that cine films that you um, had converted into DVDs? Because um, I quite often find that people have a lot of, of old technology. They have um, a cine film or even you know like slides, photographs that were printed. Or like well, I don't know, people call it printing, but were turned into slides back in the day when we used to do that. Um, which they, you know, they never, they can't look at anymore because they don't, they're not, it's old technology. Um, and they're holding on to them because they would like to get them converted, but they never get around to having it done. Um, and one thing that I always do is encourage people to actually do that, like get on and do it, and then you can uh, enjoy the, the items again. So it's really good to see that you did that, Mrs. Cynthia G. Well done, you. Um, yeah, so also um, displaying things. That's another thing to do. So if you, uh, you're talking about papers then, Mr. Cynthia G, I don't know if any of them would be displayable. Somebody by email mentioned, like in one of the examples they gave was their um, wedding speech or a speech that somebody had made at a wedding. You know, you could frame that. You could frame that and put it on the wall if you wanted to, if you really want to, uh, you know, enjoy that on, a, on an ongoing basis. Um, could you also use the things that you love to connect with other people? So if you collect something, you know, you might want to join a club or an online forum where you can, um, you know, talk about the objects that you own and, and share with other people that you love of them. Um, scrapbooking, that's another way. Um, you could, for example, some people like, for example, to, to do a, a scrapbook for each year. So as the year goes on that you put into a box, you know, the tickets from the events that you go to and I don't know, maybe photographs or I don't know what souvenirs. And then at the end of the year, you, you scrapbook them so that you've got uh, an album that you can look through to remember what the best things of that year were. So that, that's another thing that you might do. Although I will just say that scrapbooking is another um, clutter magnet. <laughs> if you're somebody who's into scrapbooking, it can be really tempting to buy loads of craft materials and loads of, I don't know, I'm not into it, so I don't know all the things people buy, but I know that it is tempting to buy loads and loads of craft materials. So don't be unrealistic, like only buy what you need. Uh, don't buy the stuff and never get around to making the scrapbook so that you've got all the crafting materials and the box of mementos, but you never make the scrapbook. Be realistic about that. But if scrapbooking is your thing, that's a really good way to to um, to honour your memories. If you're simply keeping things stored away, that's fine too. You know, if you like, as I said, I have got a memory box in my loft. Just make sure they're stored appropriately so that they won't deteriorate. Make sure that things are, you know, well packed. Anything fragile is maybe wrapped up well. Um, keep things in plastic boxes, sealed plastic boxes, so they don't go get damp, or you know, if they're in basements or whatever, they don't get attacked by um, animals or whatever. You know, make sure, just make sure things are really safely stored and um, looked after appropriately, so that you really honour your stuff. Let's look at some ways to let go of uh, sentimental stuff. You know, if you're if you're um, you are ready to let it go, but you don't just, you know, you can't just, you need to kind of 
let it go gently. Let's look at some ways to do that. Um, and again, if you've got ideas, please post them into the chat box. And one of the things I was going to mention was um, taking a photo. So Lisa's already mentioned that, which is great. So if that works for you, you might find that, you know, taking a photograph of your baby clothes, so that you've got you've got that forever. It enables you to actually let go of the baby clothes, it enables you to let go of the physical object. Some people find it helpful to hold a little ceremony to let go of things. So, you know, have a last moment with an item or, you know, or light a candle or light some incense or sit and have a glass of wine, read through those letters one last time. Like, you know, just have a little ceremony to honour the object and then that enables you to let it go. So if that, if that helps you, go ahead and do that. And we talked also about finding a new home or purpose for something. That's another way to let things go. If you're in a sort of a, a, an unsure stage, if you've got a lot of stuff that you're unsure about, one thing you could do is um, kind of put it on hold for a bit. So you could put all the things that you're not certain about in a box together, write the date on the box, and then make a note for yourself to, um, well, either to review the contents again or even just to let the whole box go without going back through it. So, you know, if you feel confident enough to do that, if you think, about it, if I haven't wanted to look at anything in that box in a year, I can just let it go. Or you can even get a friend to help you with that. You could give it to a, to a friend and say, if I've not asked for that box back or anything out of that box in a year, could you dispose of it for me? And then actually, the, if you get a friend involved and, and if they're committed to re recycling as well, they could go through the box and make sure things are disposed of appropriately, you know, recycle paper and give things to charity shops if a charity shop could sell it, rather than you going back through the box and getting caught up in stuff again. That's, that's a possibility if you feel confident that, you know, that a year, say, without a thing could be enough to be sure that you know that you no longer want it. Um, I'm just checking chat there, but OK, nothing else on chat. All right. Um, OK, well, I think I might, if nobody else has got any further questions, I might wrap up soon. A couple of last things to do. So one was I'm just going to share five questions that you can ask yourself about a sentimental item. Um, and I, I sent I shared this with Green and Tiny members this week, so you may have heard this before, and I'll post it into the chat as well. But the questions are: first, does it really bring back memories? So um, you know, so it can be easy to kind of be holding onto something for sentimental reasons, but actually, when we really consider it, to realise that actually it doesn't it doesn't evoke the memories that I thought it did. I'm just I'm just really holding onto it out of habit. Secondly, does it bring back only happy memories? Are you holding on to stuff that makes you sad, like love letters from a relationship that ended? Thirdly, have you got other stuff that brings back the same memories? And if so, do you need to keep it all or, you know, could you keep a smaller amount of it? Fourth, what's more important, the past, the present or the future? So have you got so much sentimental stuff that you can't do or fully enjoy things that you love now? And finally, who are you keeping it for? Are you keeping it because you feel guilty letting it go? Or are you keeping it because it was an unwanted gift and you're worried about hurting the giver's feelings? And if so, would they actually really notice or would they really care? Or are you keeping stuff to pass on to your kids? And if so, would they really want it? Or are you just creating a problem for them? That's five questions that you could ask yourself and I'm gonna post them into the chat box now. Question one and question two. Oh, not, oh yeah, just right, okay. And question three and four. Last one. All right, there you go. Five questions that you can ask yourself to help make a decision. Oh, chat replay may not show it. I think you need to make sure you keep the chat replay when you are done. I don't know what that means. Technical issues. What does that mean? Keep the chat replay on when you're done. Uh, tell me a bit more about that. I'll have a look in a minute. Um, and the last, oh, there's two more things I want to do. I meant to show you earlier that this is talking about transitional objects and sentimental clutter. This is Susie. Susie is the uh, the soft toy that I took to bed from me with me from the age of actually I don't know how old I was when I was given her very young preschool, um, and I took her to bed with me until I was 
18 years old. <laughs> And um, and then I considered taking her with me to university and was really brave and left her behind and then was so glad that I did and found that it was okay. I could actually sleep just fine without her. But I still can't part with her. Um, and so Deb, he was talking about soft toys and feeling guilty. Like, even though I know she's not real, um, you know, she's not actually alive, I do still feel this fondness for Susie and I will never let her go. But she lives in my memory box in the loft and I brought her down to show you today. So I wanted to show you Susie. And the other thing uh, I have to do before we get on call is see who's going to win the prize. So I'm going to shake the dice. Uh, this is it. Oh, Miss Cindy D. Let's have a look. Only the comments in the bottom will show unless you leave your chat playlist. Replay on. Okay, well, I'll try and do that. I'm not sure if I know how, but I'll give it a go. Thank you for making that point. Right, I'm going to shake the dice. Uh, let's see. How many people we got on? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. All right, we've got more than six people who could potentially win the prize. So I'm going to shake two dice. I just dropped one. I'm going to shake two dice and see which comment I'm going to win a prize. I got one and a three, which is four. So Diane, Lisa, and the Theresa B. Theresa B, uh, you have won uh, your choice of my uh, video courses free. So send me an email, rachel at mygreenandtidylife.co.uk uh, with your choice of um, video course. That's declutter sentimental stuff or declutter your bedroom or declutter paper, paper and paperwork or the upcoming digital decluttering course, which I haven't launched yet. Um, let me know which one you'd like for free and I will send you a coupon and congratulations. So thank you so much for being on this call, everyone. I really appreciate it. It's really made a difference that you're here. Um, and thank you, Mr. Cynthia G, for, um, for your positive feedback. That's fantastic. Uh, really glad you found it, uh, you liked it and found it helpful. Um, if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do that uh, and share this video uh, widely. And give me a thumbs up because it really makes a difference. Um, if you're not a Green and Tidy member, I think everybody that's commented ha is. But if you're if you're not a Green and Tidy member, do pop over to my website and join Green and Tidy and get that free uh, video course, the, um, the seven biggest clutter clearing mistakes and how to avoid them. And you also get a weekly email from me uh, with loads of tips and hints and inspiration and things to motivate you and help you with your decluttering. Um, it's been absolutely amazing doing this. It's been really great that you're all here. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's been really fun and I will do more and I will sort out the technical issues. And yep, I'm going to sign off now. So thank you everybody and goodbye. Bye.